So everybody, thank you. Welcome to my live show. I'm going to be answering your questions here, whatever they're about, for the next 45 minutes to hour. And I hope to be doing this more often. I'm planning tomorrow to do one about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, Eastern Standard Time, and uh, just to see how it goes and try to use my 34 years of experience in as a golf professional and teaching golf and helping people improve their games. Uh, many of you know my setup for impact golf method, uh, which is a single plane uh, golf swing. And so if your questions are related to that, but any swing method or questions that you may have, I'm happy to answer them for you. So I'm, like many of you, I'm stuck at home. I haven't really left the house except to walk the dog in probably a week. Uh, so and that's been a once in a week, once a week thing going out shopping. So hopefully this is over soon. We can get back to playing golf, but I've been working on a lot of videos, especially in my member section, practice sessions that you can do at home, and that's included in the membership. So there's going to be 21 practice sessions. So far, there's six. Uh, there should be eight by the end of the weekend. And basically, I'm taking you through different practice uh, situations, which you could do at home, working on uh, different parts of the swing without having to hit golf balls. Many of you can't hit golf balls at home. So uh, it's it makes sense to work on your swing, just uh, work on your swing instead of hitting and hitting and hitting, hitting golf balls. But so I think Marvin had a question about the setup for impact. What I feel moves first in the back swing. So as I start the club back, uh, I'm not really conscious of what what is moving first. Um, I believe it probably starts in my feet, uh, that it starts there. But I like to tell people, and my first three drills are talking about we're going to move, we're going to start the takeaway with the hips, upper body, the hips and upper body moving together to take the club back. And that's what's moving the arms to start out. So starting the swing there. I would probably think it probably starts, though, at the ground and moves up as it does in any athletic motion. You can look at it if you were going to throw a ball. Uh, the first thing you're doing is pushing a little bit with the feet. And so I would say it's the feet, but again, I'm not a fan of thinking about a lot of things that you don't really have to think about. Uh, if I see something in the swing where somebody starts the swing uh, with the hands, it's obviously going to make it difficult later on to get the right sequencing. So vintage Mr. D, so how is it possible for Mo Norman to control ball flight with such a different kind of swing? Let's say height and draws and fades. Well, I, I believe that Mo did it uh, simply by controlling the club. So if he wanted to hit a lower shot, that he held on a little bit longer in the downswing. So he held on. Mo was left-handed and left side dominant. So I would guess that he held on and got the grip for a lower shot, got the grip leading more going through impact. So he kind of chased it through that way uh, to hit it higher. Uh, he let it release a little bit earlier. Um, I've seen him do that. I saw him in many clinics where he called out the heights and said, here's 10 feet, 20, 30, 40, 50, uh, 60, and so on. And it was pretty impressive. Uh, I didn't see him changing ball position. Some of it I had on film. So, uh, so the only way he could have done it then in that case, is by changing the loft of the club through impact. So, uh, which is basically working on to do that. If I release earlier, the club's gonna have more loft. And if I hold off the release longer, it's gonna have less loft. Um, as far as the draw and fade, that's actually pretty easy within uh, the single plane swings. I think it's easier just to make better contact because we're set up on our impact plane. But if I set up, with the club face a little bit closed. So if here's my normal setup, and then I take the club face and I close it, and now make my normal swing, the ball should curve to the left because the club face is closed relative to the path. So without changing anything in my swing, I'm simply back and through club face is closed, and it's gonna draw. If I open the face, uh, the ball is gonna fade, uh, except for a higher lofted club, obviously to fade a nine iron, eight iron, maybe even a seven iron is a little bit more difficult uh, than the longer clubs. 
but the same idea. So if I, if I close the face, I make my normal swing, the ball's going to hook to the left or draw, depending on how closed it is. So I'm going to have to also change my aim. So if I'm aimed, let's go this way. So if I, my normal aim is here and I close the face, then I'm going to have to shift and see that I aim a little bit more to the right. Some people, and I am I want to do this once in a while, close the face a little bit, and then when I hit it, I hold it off because I'm not used to seeing the club face closed. So I'll try to picture that I really wanted to hit the ball with a closed club face. So where are we? Yeah, hey, Jerry, yeah, I've been using these, uh, these uh, super speed sticks, this training program. Let me get this out of here. So uh, these sticks, I don't know if you can see that here. It's kind of dark over here. Uh, but what it is, it's a driver length stick, and it has a weight on the end. And I've had a couple of videos on YouTube now, uh, training sessions that I've done with them. Uh, my driver speed's gone down over the past couple of years due to mainly not playing a lot uh, and not, not practicing uh, due to work and moving from Germany back here uh, to the U.S., where I'm now based in West Palm Beach, Florida. Uh, but the sticks, I'm, I'm loving it. It feels great to swing them and going through the training programs that you'll see on my uh, speed project videos on the channel here. And if you haven't seen my videos here on YouTube, you can can visit the channel and uh, check out all the videos. The recent, you'll see two of the last five videos were about gaining speed. And in the last video, I swung the lighter stick here. There's three sticks and I swung the lighter stick at uh, I think 113 miles an hour. So my goal is to get it up to about 120 and going through the, the protocols for building speed, which you can see on, on, on the videos. And it feels great to swing them and the driver feels really good afterwards. So I'm really uh, psyched about it. I think it's going to be a good, great thing. I have to do another filming the third episode tomorrow. Hey, Jason, good to see you on here. Hope that you get out there to California soon. Hey, Andre, um, stack and tilt uh, is something, I like the concept of it. Um, it's, I think my feeling has been is that people have over-exaggerated, even some of the people promoting it. So they were basically telling you you're almost going this way on the backswing that you're going to really load over the left foot. But when I see some of the pros who did it, Aaron Baddeley comes to mind, and you don't see that. You see him, you see his head really staying in position there. So I like the concept and I like the idea to have some feeling of pressure in the leading foot in the backswing so that I can really uh, push off of both feet. But I like to push off the left foot to get the hip a little bit open. So if I can get some pressure in the leading foot, I can push it open and get the hips going. And uh, otherwise, stack and tilt. I think if you do that, I don't. I really can't imagine anybody wants to go that way on the backswing because the problem is you're going to end up, in most cases, going the other way in the through swing. So if you can stay or feel like your weight stays centered on the feet, I think that's it's a good concept. And what what I'll do, what I would add to that is that uh, if you set up on your impact plane, so if you get the club in this position. As you're using that concept set up on your impact plane, uh, it's going to be probably more successful for you. Hey, Tony. Uh, steep downswing and deep divots are usually happening. Uh, are usually happening because people are not using their body to turn. So what they're doing is throwing the club down with their upper body, hands and arm. So I don't know where you can see that the best here, but it's coming down here. What we want is as the club's coming down that we can shallow out the approach that the club is moving nice and shallow through impact. 
To do that, we need to have the grip leading. If the grip is leading, but I don't turn my body, what ends up happening uh, is the club ends up crashing into the ground. So what we need to do is continue to turn going through. And I like to customize this for my students uh, so that it's to the limit of their flexibility, but we're getting, the goal is to get the body into the impact position before the club gets there so that I have a turn towards the target and I continue rotating through to shut out the impact. And so the, the cause of the, the steepness is, is uh, hands and arms leading and the body not helping. Hey, Rich, um, well, handle drag, yeah, I mean, if you're, if we're, that's one of the big things with impact, that if I can get this club or the grip leading through impact, and I have people try this, a number of my videos I've had, you actually grab a golf club, and I say, hold it in front of you like this, and then I want you to look at the club base, use your hands and do that, I want you to look at the club base rotation, and most people that I see, what they're doing they're coming in, the club's passing, or the club head's passing their hands through impact. And I want you to look at how the club face is rotating there. And then I want you to use your body to move, let it follow your body rotation through impact. And if you watch the club face, uh, you can really slow down the rotation. The club still, there's still a lot of rotation there. There's actually a lot going on behind the scenes where the club head's actually uh, because of the shaft, there's rotation that's closing the phase two. So we want to minimize it, the effect of the hands. And so as we're getting in, if the, if the handle's leading, we continue turning, we can shallow out the impact, but we can also slow the rotation so the face stays square longer, or instead of staying square longer, it's less rotation. Instead of going through impact, obviously with a lot of rotation, uh, the chances of hitting it dead square are much less than if we have a lot less rotation. Hey Marvin, yeah, I mean, I copied Mo and a number of people, uh, my customers have copied Mo in the past. And what I would recommend is, is uh, make it your own motion, find out what feels comfortable to you. Um, Mo was very unique in that he was left side, left arm dominant, and most of the people trying to copy his swing are not. Uh, he was extremely, the extreme wide stance and extreme distance from the ball worked for him because he hit millions of golf balls. And if you take the brilliance of what he did, which was his club's orientation to his hands and arms, it's set up uh, similar to what Bryson DeChambeau does, if you take that part and then just make a comfortable athletic motion, I think you'll find that it's not robotic and it's a lot more comfortable and easy to hit great golf shots. With Mo's swing, the biggest problem that I had uh, in being consistent was because of the distance from the ball, we stood quite, quite a ways away. So we stood quite a ways away in order to make great impact because of the rotation of the body, what happened is you should actually top the ball, so you have to move down into the ball. So you have to really, and that's the bent lead leg thing, keeping the feet flat. To me, it's a completely unnatural motion, and it will cost you some distance. It did me. I, I probably lost 30 or 40 yards on the driver when I was trying to do that, and uh, I gained it right back. As soon as I made a natural motion, it doesn't you know, have any negative effect uh, as far as I'm concerned, and from my experience in working with people in the past who have tried to copy Mo's swing, uh, they all improve very quickly as soon as you let them be free to move and stop trying to keep the feet planted and, and bend the knee. They will have to move a little bit closer to the ball so they can stay more level through the shot. But to me, I see only a positive in that regard. So if you continue doing what you're doing, try to move a little closer. Uh, try to feel like you can stay a little bit more level and a little bit more natural in the swing.
Hey, Andrew. Uh, well, yeah, as far as the pendulum swing, uh, you know, the, 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 this is a pendulum. Uh, Mo studied a lot of, you know, different instructors and what, what they taught. And really, the probably the purest swinging motion is a pendulum. And so when you see, I can hold the club here and it moves all on its own due to gravity back and forth. Uh, just as far as a golf swing, they talk about a double pendulum model and a lot of other things, how the, the involving the arms. But really, we're using the body to move it. So if you look at Mo's swing uh, and how he moved the club, and it was very, you would see how he, how he moved it back. And again, he's controlling it with his left side. And when it goes through, it is like a pendulum through impact. The problem is a pendulum is always vertical. And when we get into golf, and to me, the farther that you get away from the ball, as Mo was, the harder it is to swing uh, as a pendulum. And that's why I like what Bryson DeChambeau does better, because he's standing over it. The club's more in an upright or vertical position, or it's more vertical, which is what I'll have my customers do in chipping, is set up very upright because the effects of gravity are less and and it's going to be, you can swing much more like a pendulum. It's a lot freer swing. You can use gravity to control the swing. This is vertical. So you can take a club and hold it like this and then try to take it out there where you're trying to set up and you'll feel the weight of the club due to gravity trying to be pulled down here. So uh, I think as far as Mo is concerned, he probably felt it in his lead arm and as that moving as a pendulum. So if I if, if that's a pendulum type move, um, Mo felt a lot of things and talked about a lot of things that also when he looked at video, people say, well, he didn't do that. But I think he was relating a feeling that he had of a pendulum that felt free and easy. And after hitting a few million balls, I guess that makes sense that it would feel pretty easy to him. Hey, Thomas. Uh, yeah. I mean, as far as how my takeaway thoughts, um, what I what I find really important is first getting in the right setup position and making sure that you're setting up with the club on the same plane as your trailing arm. And I'll, what I'll do, I have the trailing arm bent in. You just see where the camera is. So I have the trailing arm bent in, but I have the wrist in an uncocked position. So it looks like this. And all I'm trying to do it is to turn to start back with the hips and upper body turning and from there I just cock the wrist and so as long as I'm not picking the club up this way or that I have unnecessary start out the swing with arm rotation as long as I do that it's going to be pretty close to on plane so in my teaching I really spend very little time if there's, if there's a serious issue there that people I do have occasionally a couple uh, people in recent schools come to mind who are letting go. They had some really bad habits. And then you really need to focus with drills one, two, and three in my learning program. Uh, they're on my website, but they're also for free on YouTube. If you look up uh, single plane learning program uh, or look at my channel, you'll find them. Uh, I also have drills one through six and the ball striking drills. But if you follow those, it takes you step by step through. Uh, if you're a member of my website, you can also send in videos through the free B1 Golf app, which is uh, uh, no extra charge. And I do have a deal on membership right now, a lifetime special at this time uh, for $99.98. So if you're a lifetime member, you can send in videos for my review, and then I can coach you through it that way. And I'm really happy to hear everybody that's doing so well. And I love seeing people at my schools. So uh, feeling the club lift, I don't really, uh, should you feel the club lift? I don't, you know, I think people, when they do that, they may, they may feel you know, that that's the hands that's doing that. I like to have the idea that, that again, it's a complete,
complete. And I, I get a lot of people really focused on the backswing. It's, you know, it's okay. Uh, it is the first three drills in my program are dealing here with how to take the club back. And, and if I start out with upper body rotation, uh, that can get me, that can get me off plane. If I start with my hands, that's going to get the club in a bad position. So we really want to get, to get a feeling for just turning, turning, going back. So my drill number one has you turning to here, and then we turn back the other way to impact. So we will go something like that, but that's getting you started in the right direction. And so the club goes up simply uh, because of the turning of my body. So if the, if the club was just attached here to the center of my body and I turn, the club's going up. And it's because of the, the forward bend here and then the rotation. So the club is going up, but I don't feel it. So the wrist will start to cock as I get in this area and we go to drill two, we're getting into this area and then drill three a little bit farther. Uh, but if you're set up in your impact plane, you should be close to that plane at the top of the swing. It doesn't have to be perfect, uh, but as long as there's no manipulation, which we're trying to eliminate over time, uh, you know, you're going to be pretty close to what we need. And the money area of this golf swing is, of course, here as we swing through impact. So we need to have the club moving like that through impact uh, properly with the club leading. So my learning program, which you can access on YouTube, uh, it's actually free on YouTube. On the website, I have also a number of practice training sessions where you can practice along with what you see me doing. That's a new feature on the website for members. And uh, it also allows you, you can also send in videos through the V1 Golf app. I'm getting a lot of videos now from people who are stuck at home and filming like me. I'm in my office here and I know you can see the lights here a little bit, but uh, it makes the video a lot better and uh, it's pretty cramped area here. You would be surprised how small uh, this actually is. If you see on the backswing, I can almost, as an eight iron, almost hitting the walls here. I can just make a swing. I have a net for outside and uh, maybe in the future I'll do some uh, shots out there, uh, hoping that the golf course is open again soon. So get back to business. Hey, Dave. Um, well, yeah, the, uh, the uh, similarities with stack and tilt with setup for impact are really the idea is that I really am trying to stay centered as far as there's no head movement. I don't want you to go this way, but I don't believe stack and tilt wants to see that either. Uh, so I think it's very similar. Uh, with, of course, the setup is a big difference, and the biggest difference uh, between my method and conventional golf methods, and stack and tilt is conventional, uh, is simply I don't set up with an angle between the trailing arm and the club. So this is how you set up conventionally, even though at impact you're going to be here. Uh, and conventionally you're setting up pretty much with the trailing arm straight and the club at an angle. And then impact, it's bent in like this. And so I have you just set up that way. It's bent, the trailing arm's bent in, the wrists are uncocked. And what happens, that takes away having to compensate for that change, which is about four inches of the club moving away. And you have to pull it in here. Obviously, if you hit millions of balls as uh, when you're younger, a, a teenager or younger, uh, you figure it out pretty good in some cases, but even most kids learning the game at an early age, they don't become tour players. So some of them are single digit, a lot of them aren't. So it, it's very, very difficult. So stack and tilt, I think it's a good fit. And then following these principles, and you'll see most tour players today, I, I really don't see, I can't think of any that have a lot of motion with the head moving back or the, you know, I don't see a hip sway anymore on the backswing, so the hips are turning in place. And that's all I want to see is turn in. Uh, and I really don't see it as that different. So, Hey, Marvin. So uh, the, picking the target line, so 
I'll do it uh, if the camera is the target here. Uh, what I'm doing in my setup, and you can see this in the uh, learning program video on uh, my complete learning program is on YouTube. So if you look at, I think it's uh, yes, yeah, step two uh, setup, and you'll see me a lot. What I'm doing first, I'm putting the club in my hand, my leading hand, and checking the orientation. But as I'm getting set up, what I'm doing is I'm trying to see a line. So I, I could aim the club right at my target. So in this case, you guys, the camera's my target. And then when I hold the club there, I look down and I just line up my feet with that. So I see a straight line. If we go this way, I'm looking, I'm aimed. I'm aiming my feet at the target. And I like to have my feet slightly open. So if you're hitting the ball with a little bit of a descending angle, I would prefer a little bit open as opposed to closed as far as the stance and alignment. Most people that I see end up getting their feet. So if I want to aim this way, they get their feet going out that way. And now to get the ball to the target, what they have to do is make a compensation. So they're either going to come over it. In most cases, it's that. So they're releasing early, which closes the face. And then the ball's going to the target sometimes, but they're adding this rotation so they can hit it to the left, they can hit it to the right. Uh, they're compensating for their aim, which is, you know, really something I deal with in my schools. Uh, in a lot of cases, that can take a couple of days uh, to get people, you know, lining up properly. And it's something I'm really a stickler on that if you're not aiming properly with your body, it's just, you know, it's manipulation, compensation, city. And I don't see how you can be consistent doing that. And, uh, you know, that's just every, everybody knows how important it is, but very few take the time to make sure that it's correct. So what I'll have people do also in the school, if we're getting lined up, I'll say, okay, go ahead and get set up. Once you're ready to go, what I want you to do, take the club down, put it along your toes, and then step back and check to see if you set up properly. So on the range, you could be working on something like that to you know, check yourself and pick a different target, pick a target over there, pick a target over there, change clubs often. Um, that's how I like to practice, check your, check your, I'm checking my aim all the time because uh, yeah, somehow standing over a golf ball and aiming, uh, I just think it's one of the most difficult things. Hey, uh, vintage Mr. D, do you mean scoop? Stop scope in your setup for impact. I, I, I And what I have people doing in my uh, learning program, all of the drills are based on getting the body turned before the club goes through impact. So you can see what happens if I'm in my setup position and I turn my body to where I want to be at impact. So I'm going that way. You can see the grip here gets, just, just holding it here, the grip gets pushed forward. So my body rotation is going to help the club get ahead of the ball. Now, a lot of people have it as a habit. They play golf forever with very active hands. So part of the drills, ball striking drill number one, has people learning to move here. And what I'll have them do once they're in this finished position with practice swings first, uh, most people, even in the schools, they're there. And so if they extend the club, it's running into their stomach. So you need to learn to practice with feedback to see what short swings first. So if I get a shot here, and then I can check it. I was actually more ahead than I normally would want it. And so if you keep checking yourself, and then in my school, some of the advanced drills I'll have you also, uh, if you're really an extreme case where you can't get rid of it, I'll have you moving with just one hand, the trailing hand, and seeing that this space at setup, so normal setup, take it away, and then check to see that we can move through and keep this distance the same or have even more distance between the grip and the forearm 
when we go through. So that's how I would work. Stop that. No problem. I got you, Vintage. Hey, Jason. Yeah, um, single length golf clubs. Uh, I get this a lot, obviously, uh, because of Bryson. Uh, that's where all of the iron from wedges to longest iron, and in some cases, hybrids are all the same length as a seven iron. Uh, sometimes they do it as an eight iron length. Uh, but for me, uh, I don't see a lot of people who are able to get the proper spacing between each club in that within that system. So because the wedges are the length of a seven iron, for a lot of people, they tend to fly farther than they did in the past. At the same time, a five iron or four iron, if you have one, tends to not fly far enough. So when I tried it, I went through a fitting and I did try that as part of the thing. It was a really a brand neutral fitting. And I asked also to try the single length clubs. And I tried, in that case, the Edale uh, single length clubs. So they had a nice fitting system for that. And in the fitting, I was hitting the uh, Callaway six iron that I was using for the fitting. I was hitting about 185 to 190 yards. And the four iron, from the single same length set, I was hitting about 170 or 165 yards. It just wasn't getting up in the air. They tried some different shafts and it just, for me, it just didn't make sense because of that. I, I need to hit the four and then uh, 200, 210 yards uh, for it to make sense, 210 yards carry in that scenario. And it just was no way for me. Uh, and I think that's kind of a fitting issue it could also be swing speed, uh, but, you know, I just didn't decided not to mess around with it at that point. I've contacted Cobra. I've never gotten a response from them about interest in what they're doing. Obviously, it works pretty well for Bryson. However, I'm not sure, you know, with the wedges, it seems like he's trying a lot of different wedges. Uh, a while back, I recommended to Bryson uh, through messages, uh, which I did not get a response to. Uh, but suggestions that, you know, use normal wedges. He's having trouble with distance control with the wedges and spin rates. Uh, to me, it would make sense. Just use normal wedges and then go maybe pitching wedge or pitching nine, eight, seven, six, the same length. Uh, if you can get the proper spacing, you could play with the loft a little bit and uh, go that route. But you need to be working on a launch monitor in that case. And again, it depends what you you know, what your goals are uh, for somebody that's a 30 handicap or even a 20, uh, doesn't have time to mess around with things. Uh, you know, it may be great. And I have some people that's, you know, I've had swear by it, love it. I've had guys in schools, they do pretty good with it as far as I could see. And, uh, you know, you, you just want to see that, uh, you're getting decent distance dispersion between the club and the rescues, I tried a couple hybrids that were seven iron length, and I just couldn't hit them far enough. So, uh, again, but they, they weren't fit to me. So that's all I'd be looking for is to see that they, you know, fit for me. And Bryson, I think uh, his longest iron may be a five iron. So to me, I would love it if it worked and I had a four and three iron that flew the right distance at that length. I think it'd be fantastic. And maybe they'll get there. So. Um, let me see, Marvin, though, he has a follow-up setup. When you tilt, does that impact or change? Yeah, what happens with the tilt? So if we talk about if, if uh, I'm tending to have an open club face uh, through impact, you know, if I don't have enough tilt, so if I'm set up here and an impact, I have a lot more tilt, what that tends to do from what I've seen with people is it tends to open the club face. So if you tend to have an open club face, it's something I'd be looking at 
is adding a little tilt. And so I do that in the setup. I'm moving the leading hip over the leading foot, and the, my head is positioned over the center to back of my stance. And so that's going to be close to matching that impact. I may have a little bit more tilt at impact, uh, and, and either that's fine. Again, I'm using, I'm holding the club in a way that fits to my impact position. That's how I adjust. If you have too much tilt and then you hit the ball and you, it doesn't allow you to turn through the shot because you have so much tilt, uh, I might expect the ball to go left or to, for a right-handed golfer, tend to close the face. Uh, so there's a lot of variables that are going on there. I just I, I like to see this look here at setup that the hip is close to being over the lead foot. It could be back a little bit, but close, and so that the hips can rotate in the space they're set up in, and and it's easier for people to get this impact leading foot like that as opposed to starting in the conventional position where you rotate going back and then we need to get the hip in that position as we're trying to rotate. So for me, it's one last step and I like to simplify things. Did anybody else not get that uh, single length uh, iron answer? It'll probably, anyway, it'll come back. When it plays back, it should have the whole thing. Um, Hey, Rob. Uh, yeah, I think I saw you ask this. I haven't gotten to the answering all the YouTube comments. Um, the shaft, as far as single plane or non-single plane, uh, it's you don't need anything special or different uh, in that regard. As far as getting fit for a shaft, what I did in my fitting, I tried as many as options as possible uh, on a track man to get the right spin and, and uh, launch conditions. Uh, for, for me, and it's really, I haven't had to change shafts. The shaft that I use conventionally uh, works fine for single plane and so on. It's just because impact is gonna be the same. So if I'm set up here and I impact here, or I set up here and I impact here, it doesn't really matter. If you gain speed, you may need a little bit different of a shaft and you know, with all the different torques and bend points and Today, there's a ton of different shafts available. And I went through a process with Club Champion. That's who I do my fitting with, and that's who I recommend. Uh, also, my customers who go there, if you say that you're one of my uh, customers, uh, you get 5% off on a fitting. Uh, they do a tremendous job. And what I ended up with in, in, sorry, in the driver is this uh, Fujikura. 661 Evolution 4, as it's a fantastic shaft for me. Other people who try it, maybe not. I tried probably 20 different shafts with the driver uh, to find out that this one was the best. And it was, it was obvious when I hit it. And so I really don't think you should be uh, going out and say, hey, try, take this shaft. Or I know a lot of people do fitting and say, oh, based on your swing speed, this is the shaft you need. It's just you know, I don't do things that way. You know, I know some people don't have the option to go through a fitting like that. And in that case, I have you go to a place that allows you to test drivers on a launch monitor so that you can at least see the differences and feel the differences of the different shafts and try as many as you can. Don't focus on a single brand. Uh, try as many different options as possible. So some companies have two or three or four different shaft options. Try them all. Uh, try them with Cobra and Ping and Callaway and TaylorMade. And finding the right shaft is the most important thing. And then make sure the driver's not too long. Most people end up with drivers over 45 inches. Uh, tour average is a, the last I heard about 44 and a half, which is about an inch shorter than what most people play. So uh, get the right shaft. 
uh, whatever you can do, even if you just do a driver fitting, it's worth it to have a shaft that fits you perfectly and you're swinging. It doesn't matter if it's single plane or conventional. Um, yeah, Vintage Mr. D. No, I wouldn't shorten golf clubs. I would, uh, the lie angle is going to depend on a number of variables, how tall you are, how long your arms are, how far you stand from the ball, and how much you bend forward. So to find out uh, the lie angle that you need, and, and if, you're, if you're going from the conventional swing to a single plane swing, and you're moving from, from here at setup to here, but you keep the distance from, from the ball the same at setup. So if I'm set up here, so you're set up here, and you go here, impact is still going to be the same. So from what I've seen, there should be no change necessary. Now, a lot of people doing this were trying to copy Mo Norman, so they went from here. And then they move the ball way out there, so they're standing really far from the ball. So if you're standing farther away, you need a flatter golf club. If you stand closer, you'll need a more upright golf club. So all things being equal. So um, depending on how uh, where you are. So golf clubs need to be fit for impact. And even if the golf club is sitting flat, sold on the ground at setup, and if impact is on that same plane, the club is still going to have droop, meaning that the club shaft is bending the head down, so the shaft is bowed this way, uh, which necessitates a more upright club than what you see at setup. But again, I have also people, they set up up here, and their impact is here. So what we need to do is be fit for impact for the lie angle. And what happens, what we do there, we put you onto a live board, put the ball on a live board, which is a piece of plexiglass or plastic, and we put some tape on the bottom of the club, and then you hit some shots off of the board, and it shows you where the sole is making contact with the ground at impact. So if we see a mark in the center, we know the lie was correct. I don't know if you can see, it's kind of dark back here. So you see, that the lie is correct. If it's marking towards the toe, that would say we need to bend up that way, more upright. If it's marking towards the towards the heel, that size that impact that's going through there, the, then the club needs to be flatter. And so the only way to reliably be fit is being fit for impact. Hey guys, yeah, I'm sorry if there are streaming issues. Um, sometimes it's your uh, your bandwidth, or I think there's a lot of demand on bandwidth these days. I have an extremely fast internet connection. Uh, that doesn't mean it's perfect probably, but it's very, very fast as far as upload and download speed. Uh, what you can do is go back and uh, this will be live or this will be on demand. I think if you go on my channel and you click the live button, you can see all the live shows that I've done, and then you can move ahead to this point. Just note what, uh, how many minutes in. So we're now about 45 minutes in. So you go 45 minutes, and then you can go back and see. And uh, it should be recording everything. As far as I can see, I can see myself on a monitor and uh, on the iPad here where I can read the questions, and it seems to be working okay here. Uh, and I'm sorry for any of that. The question about lie angle, I think I answered it. Um, really, if you end up setting up closer to the ball with set up for, set up for impact, so if you're normal set, if you were copying Mo Norman, and now you, you're standing closer, but you're still single plane, uh, then you would likely need a slightly more upright club. Again, 
go to a pit or go to a place where you can measure off a live horn. Uh, you can actually hit some balls off a piece of plexiglass and put a piece of electrical tape on the bottom. You can check it out. Many clubs can be adjusted for that. Uh, from my experience, even people playing conventionally or uh, if they're trying to copy Mo Norman, their clubs aren't fitting their impact anyway because when they did the fitting or bought the clubs, they did not hit from a live board and have it measured. You want to measure it to be sure at impact. In some cases, you can look at the divot and see what's going on, if it fits or not, but uh, that's an important issue. One second. So the transition, Marvin, let me. And guys, I re recommend when you, to learn more about the setup for impact swing, uh, look for that. Uh, if you're not a member of my website, uh, you can uh, look on my YouTube channel here. There's a lot of videos, but there's some that show you the drills. And in that I'm talking about the as we're getting near the top it depends on the length of swing but uh the transition is i'm going to start with my feet and my feet are going to apply pressure to the ground which are going to get the hips turning before the club starts down so all of the drills are teaching you how to do that and so they're showing you step by step how to go through that and we're doing that first without golf balls so uh a lot of the top players uh, will practice a lot without golf balls. I've yet to meet an amateur uh, who comes to my golf schools or otherwise uh, who practiced ever without golf balls. So the way to get a feel for emotion and to improve it would be if I stood here and I want to work on the transition. First, I'm going to start with a very short swing. So my ball strike drill number one, I do without golf balls first. Now I'll take it back and as, as the club's going back, I'm going to start turning, going through. So back, and I'm turning. So I just transitioned to impact. So back. So much like if I was going to toss a ball, if my arm's going back, my arm's going back, I'm already turning. And so and that's coming from the ground. So look for drills one through six. That's a video. You put single plane drills one through six. On my YouTube channel, you'll find it. Um, or the complete, it's in the complete video, which is nine, 56 minutes or something on uh, my YouTube channel. It's a green thumbnail that says complete learning system. Uh, you'll find all of that. Uh, for those who want to support my work, I do have a special $50 off on my lifetime membership. It's less than $100. It's like $99.98 uh, for a limited time now. Uh, and that allows you to send in videos also for my review. Let me see. So golf India, um, how high you lift the arms would depend on your flexibility. I don't, I'm not a fan of, of trying to lift the arms, except that it's going to be through my body rotation. So I'm going to see how far I can comfortably turn going back to the limit of my flexibility uh, at the same time uh, keeping uh, the coil or keeping the weight on the inside of the trailing leg and some bend in the trailing knee. So I'm gonna see, I'm limited maybe right now to here. I'm not gonna do anything independently uh, to lift the arms up, but it's all through the rotation of my body and that's gonna be the limiting factor. So. Anybody, anybody have any other questions? I'm going to move on and I'll be on tomorrow, probably around one o'clock in the afternoon. So uh, it could be noon. I'm going to put that in in the morning when I'm sure what my plans are, uh, but it'll be sometime in that range and answering questions. Again, it can be, again, any topic and uh, we're going to go from there.
please check out my website, learninggolf.tv. Uh, all of my information is on there, as well as practice sessions that you can work with along, work along with at home, where I show you uh, practice and drills and we work together. Uh, and again, membership allows you to send in videos for my review. And I hope to have some schools up and running as soon as we're allowed to do that again. Looking at North Carolina at the end of May with Tony Griffin, who's my master instructor up there. He does a great job. Just shot his age again the other day. Uh, he's doing great. And we're going to do a school together up there, which will be playing on the golf course uh, and working on the swing. So it'll be mornings mainly practice and afternoons on the golf course, along with a possible training session afterwards after the golf. Hoping to do that, I think, May 30th to June 1st, if if it's permitted to do that. And possibly uh, in the middle of June, that was supposed to be middle of May, but it's obviously going to have to move that back due to the current situation. Uh, and then Cincinnati, uh, possibly end of June, not sure yet on that. But it looks like they're relaxing restrictions up there in Ohio now as well. So let me see. Anybody else have anything else? Great, thanks. Glad that you guys enjoyed the session. Again, I hope you have a great day. Stay safe, and I will see you next time.